Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday in Easter week. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So the gospel appointed for today is from the very end of Luke. Uh, it's a familiar one, I think, to you. It's the story of the road to Emmaus. Now, I have watched quite a lot of uh, online worship services in the past few weeks, and I have come to the conclusion that one of the most boring things in the world is for a priest to stand there and read the Bible at you. Uh, so I'm going to tell you this passage is Luke chapter 24, ver verses 13 to 35, and invite you to read it for yourselves. Uh, examine, pray, study, and further, I would suggest not looking it up online, but actually taking a Bible. Luke 24, 13 to 35, I am hugely in favor of putting Bibles in the hands of Episcopalians. But I'll tell you the outline of the story. So it takes place still on Easter day. It is the same day as the resurrection of Jesus. It's now in the evening. And two disciples, doesn't tell us which ones, two disciples are headed home to Emmaus. Now, the fact that they're headed home tells us something, that they've given up. So they haven't gone very far when a stranger joins them and says, uh, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they, they look at him like he's crazy. They say, how, how do you not know uh, the events that have happened in Jerusalem these last few days? And the stranger says, well, tell me. So they tell him all about Jesus of Nazareth and how they had hoped that he was the Messiah. It's one of the saddest verses in the entire Bible. We had hoped. Past tense. There is no hope anymore. So they tell him all the events that have happened, and as the stranger listens, he says, well, how, how did you guys not know that this is what was destined to happen to the Messiah. And he begins to explain to them, using all these examples from the scriptures, that all of this was necessary. So eventually they, they come to Emmaus, and the stranger makes as if he's going to keep going on. But the two disciples say, no, no, man, why, why don't you come, come to our house? Come and have dinner with us. So he accepts, and they sit at the table, and the stranger takes a piece of bread, and after he gives thanks, he breaks it and gives it to them. And in that moment, their eyes are opened and they realize they've been with Jesus all along. And then he disappears, which is a sermon for another time. So if you caught our Maundy Thursday reflection, uh, I stood here just about a week ago in front of this little box here, and there was bread and wine in it. And at the end of our service time, we invited you to pray and reflect on the presence of Christ in the consecrated bread and wine. Well, now this box is empty, which is a very unusual circumstance in an Episcopal church. Um, this is called an ombre. And this is where bread and wine that is left over after the celebration of the Holy Eucharist is stored in a reverent location. Uh, there's two reasons for this. The first and foremost is practical. This is so that uh, if there are people who by reason of age or other infirmity uh, cannot be present with us on Sundays but would still like to participate in communion, someone is sick, someone is in the hospital, um, then we can take the bread and wine to them. And it's not just for ease so that, oh, it's right there. No, it's really that they can participate in the same sharing of bread, the same sharing of cup that we had here on Sunday to show that they really are part of our community, even though they weren't here physically with us at that time, but they still get to participate in communion with the people of St. Paul's. And the second purpose is that while the bread and wine are here, there's always a candle lit, always a candle burning whenever the bread and wine are in the ombre. And that is to signify to us Christ's abiding presence. 
And this is something that has become really important for Episcopalians. We come and we pray in this place, seeing that light, knowing that Christ is here. Well, there's also a custom in Holy Week that by the end of Maundy Thursday, all bread and wine that has previously been consecrated is reverently consumed, and then the box is empty until we celebrate Eucharist again for the first time on Easter. And now we're in this incredibly weird situation where we can't celebrate the Eucharist for reasons of safety. So the ombre remains empty. And maybe that makes you feel sad. Maybe that makes you feel anxious. It does me. I mean, I, I love the Holy Eucharist. And I would really like to know, when are we going to get to do this again? When will our people be here? But I invite you to think of the ombre now more like that empty tomb and how the first apostles on that Easter morning felt when they saw the empty tomb and the anxiety and the worry that they had about where is Jesus, when actually this was a sign of tremendous hope. So those disciples walking home to Emmaus didn't realize that Jesus was already with them. They were sad, they were scared, they were worried. Just because they couldn't see Jesus didn't mean he wasn't there. Just because we don't know right now how God is at work in all of this doesn't mean that God isn't at work. This is where our faith really comes in. We have to trust based on all the teachings of the church, based on the Bible, based on our faith, that God is in this, even though right now what we see is very scary. We are full of anxiety and worry and fear. It's okay. God is with us this day and always. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we come before you with hearts full of prayers, for needs and for worries, for ourselves and on behalf of others. Be with us now and help us to know and to trust that you are already at work in our lives, doing better things for us than we can ask or imagine. Grant to all who seek you the assurance of your presence, your power, and your peace. Grant your healing grace to all who are sick, that they may be made whole in body, mind, and spirit. Grant to all who minister to the suffering wisdom and skill, sympathy, and patience. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful, and lift up all who are brought low. We commend to Almighty God all those who have died, and remember with compassion those who mourn. I invite you now, silently or aloud, to name before God in prayer all those you carry in your heart, and to ask for grace in your own life. I invite you now to offer thanks to God for the innumerable blessings of this world. Almighty God, whose Son revealed in signs and miracles the wonder of your saving presence, renew all your people with your heavenly grace and in all our weakness, sustain us by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.